Thanks, Ron. And um, thanks also to the uh, Duke, UNC, and NC State organizers for inviting me. I'm so honored and delighted to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is talk to you today about AI and robots. So what are some of the things we like robots to do for us? We like them to fetch things, clean, tidy up our houses, assemble furniture, take inventory, like find out where I left my keys last night, um, and prepare meals for us. And I think this idea that one of, I think, um, is when we can get one robot that can do a range of tasks like these, that it becomes useful to put a general purpose robot in every home. And by way of contrast to this, most of us already have robots in our homes today. We call them the dishwasher, the washing machine, and the dryer. And so I think we've become very good at building single-purpose robots, but I think the revolution in robotics would come when we can build one piece of hardware that can do many different things. Um, this is an old dream, and of course, in the history of AI and robotics, there have been many attempts to, to, to do this sort of thing. And just two of the perhaps more notable examples of, of work to try to build general purpose robotics were the examples of Shaky and Flaky. Um, but today, we still do not have, ro have general purpose robots in our homes, and, and I think there are a number of reasons for this. One reason is that this earlier work in AI tended to focus on problems of um, explicit world models, high level representations and reasoning, trying to model the world using you know, first order logic or other representations. Whereas the reason I can't get a robot to um, tidy up my house today is not the high level planning or power planning problems, rather I think is the much lower level problems of perception and control. So the um, reason I can't get the robot to do these things can't get the robot to look at the picture and figure out where the people in the picture are or um, face a door and you know, use low level controls to ma manipulate the door handle. So what I'm going to do today is talk about a much um, talk about a bottom-up approach to building this sort of robot, in which we're going to start by trying to address the low-level problems and then build our way up. And in particular, let's start by talking about robotic control. And this will lead us um, into a discussion on of, of the idea of explicit world models. So. To motivate this, let's say you want to get a robot to pick up this coffee mug, and let's say you've never seen this coffee mug before. Um, how do you write code to get a robot to pick this up? If we turn to the classical um, AI textbook using, you know, essentially almost all AI classes, including my own, Russell and Norvig, um, this picture in Russell and Norvig second ed, and uh, essentially the same picture appears in the first edition of this sort of classical standard AI textbook of, of the structure of an intelligent agent, in which you have, um, you see on the figure, you have the environment, which you sense through your senses. Based on your senses, you build you know, an understanding of what the world is like now. Based on what the world is like now, you decide what actions to take, and you send that to your actuators. So applying this sort of standard architecture to our problem, this is what you might have, right? You might have sensor inputs, um, images of your coffee mug, and based on that, you'd attempt to build a 3D model of your coffee mug, say. Then it turns out that in robotic manipulation, there are standard algorithms called form and force closure algorithms that use essentially physics calculations to try to find a stable grasp given the 3D model of your object. And finally, you know, this hopefully gives you a grasp strategy uh, shown by the red cross on the slide of, of the quote correct place at which to pick up a coffee mug. So um, we start to try to build this pipeline. Let's take the first step of building a 3D model of the coffee mug. There's a coffee mug. And using a good commercial stereo vision system, um, this was a typical example of the stereo depth map we get, where the different shades of gray indicate different, color, uh, indicate different distances, and black is where stereo fails to return any depth estimate because it failed to find correspondences. Zooming in to where the coffee mug is is just a mess, right? You can barely tell if the handle of the mug is on the left or right. Um, and more generally, I believe it is well beyond the state of the art in, in sensor technology you know, to build a 3D model of an object that you're seeing for the first time from one view. The, the, the rear half of the coffee mug is always going to be occluded. So looking at this pipeline, turns out we just don't know how to build a 3D model. Turns out that even if you do have a 3D model, it turns out that um, form and force closure algorithms often don't work that well in, in, in terms of, uh, and, and, and are computationally very expensive and often give you non robust solutions. So, given this pipeline, we actually don't know how to do either of the intermediate steps. Um, 
A few years ago, we proposed a different approach in which we start from an image and try to go directly from the image to identify a good strategy for picking up a coffee mug, what we call a grass point shown on the right. And I'm actually going to come back and amend this lower figure later. Um, but just to flesh this out, what one of my students, um, Ashtar Saxiner, did was create a training set using machine learning. So create a training set comprising five types of objects shown here. And for each of these objects, um, he marked the object with the, quote, correct place at which to grasp the object. So the, the red cross shows the correct place at which to grasp it. I'm not crossing out the objects. So you pick up a pencil by the midpoint, a, a martini glass by the stem, um, a coffee mug by the handle, and so on. And you then apply machine learning, you apply what's called supervised learning, to learn a function mapping from the raw input image, um, mapping from the input image to the location at which to attempt a grasp. And it turns out, if you do this, this actually works much better. So let me show you a video of um, the learned grasping strategy in action. And that little round ball on the robot arm is an inexpensive webcam. And with, you know, even um, low quality webcam images, you can often grasp a wide variety of objects. Training set was the last five objects you saw, so there's no cell phone in the training set. Right, and oh, we went to a dollar store to buy strange shaped objects. Um, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> so, Instead of going through a complex world representation like a 3D model, um, this is one instance of an approach that instead learns a direct input-output mapping without sort of complex explicit world uh, representation of the world. But I actually want to take this lower picture and refine it a little bit, which is that what we do is not really go straight from the raw image to the machine learning algorithm to learn the grasp point. What we do is actually um, give the machine learning algorithm an intermediate representation of, of uh, of, sort of computer vision features. And um, by way of contrast, if, if you think about what is the right representation for a coffee mug, you can think of lots of possible representations, like a 3D model, maybe you want to know the friction properties, maybe you want to know the center of Mars, and, 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 and you know, much more complex things, much more complex objects. And we just don't know how to compute or code up many of these features. And instead, what seems to work is using very low-level computer vision features um, and to use these, uh, say, edge detection and other features as, as, as a representation through which our algorithm views the world. And um, this actually lends the low-level vision features a certain primacy, and, and let's come back to this later as well. So, um, more broadly, the, uh, the approach of um, this, this sort of uh, issue comes up in other control problems as well. Here's, here's another fun example. Um, so the approach that I actually used to you know, push for many years was, was the one shown at the top, in which um, this was in my, thesis, in my old, now very old PhD thesis work, for instance, in which I said, you know, the right way to fly a helicopter is to um, maybe have someone demonstrate flying, and then you learn the dynamics model of the helicopter, and based on the dynamics model, you run, say, a reinforcement learning algorithm, and um, that learning algorithm gives you a control of a helicopter. Let me actually start by showing you a video made by a friend, David Shim, in which he applied this sort of pipeline to a helicopter yet up at Berkeley. Um, when I play the video, you hear David's voice come on and say, enable control, and that's when the you know, controller that he developed using this approach takes over. Enable control! Right. That was him shouting, abort, abort. Um, so it turns out that um, in all the years that, I guess, my former student Peter and I and others work on helicopters, I've actually not seen anyone ever develop an accurate hel model of any helicopter. Right. Um, so in contrast to relying on this sort of, again, um, explicit world representation, explicit representation of helicopter dynamics, this is the approach that actually did work. This is the approach that actually did work for us, which is, um, let's see, most algorithms re rely some dynamics model, and we also use what's called a reward function, means roughly the same thing as a cost function. And it's based on these two inputs that a uh, uh, optical control or reinforcement learning algorithm learns a control strategy. And if you... Um, uh, I guess peek under the hood. What the dynamics model, 
the dynamics model that we use is actually a learned dynamics model that's learned as a function of low-level features of the state or position and orientation of the helicopter. And similarly, the reward function is also a, a reward or cost function that's learned as a function of a very low-level state or feature representation of the helicopter demonstration. And it's giving these two things as inputs and developing a, a learning algorithm that can deal even with inaccurate dynamics model that, um, that we've uh, which, is, which was our latest approach to flying helicopters. And in fact, if you peer inside the hood of what is the controller, you see again one of these templates where the way you choose actions is again as a function of these sort of low-level state features. Um, and taking this sort of approach, let me actually go ahead and um, show you results of, uh, this is uh, Peter Abu and Adam Coates' work on uh, using this approach to develop a helicopter controller. So all this is um, all this is a video of the helicopter after the uh, learning album has finished training, and you see the controller take the helicopter through a series of aerobatic maneuvers. So a split S, that's a fast 180 degree turn, snap row. Stall turn, that's another fast 180 degree turn. Um, loops, it's going to do two loops. That's the first one and the second one. At the top of that loop is going to do a pirouette right there. It's kind of hard to see. That was a fast spin. Um, another stall turn done fine backwards. Hurricane, the helicopter is banked steeply at about 55 degrees. Knife A should control the horizontal fall. Um, stationary rows, this turns out to be one of the most difficult maneuvers. Stationary flips, another very difficult maneuver. Um, tick top, just like a grandfather clock pendulum but done upside down on a helicopter. And so on. And I should say that, you know, whereas uh, there are at least maybe at least half a dozen groups just in the United States working that were working on helicopter controls, uh, most notably, I think, Eric Ferrand's group at MIT and Georgia Tech. Um, I think in this work, we were able to make those advance because we were able to use learning algorithms together with relatively simple feature, relatively simple um, low-level feature representations. And... Um, this work is not about rejecting explicit world representations, not about rejecting models of the world, but rather I think is that we often have no idea how to construct such representations. And um, um, one of the lessons learned in the last few years of AI is that it's often simple, it's often enough to use simple low-level feature representations with machine learning to, com to construct relatively simple representations. Um, so that was machine learning for control. Let me move on and say a little bit about machine learning for perception. And this in particular will lead us into a discussion of, um, on the idea of embodiment and embodied perception. So computer vision is hard. Um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, my students and I tried to implement a uh, object detection system for recognizing coffee mugs and, you know, reading the state-of-the-art papers in the field and making our honest best effort at implementing those, um, uh, those algorithms, this was roughly the best result. This, this was actually roughly the best result we could get, right? And uh, I, if, if you think that sort of a real computer vision person like Carla would do much better than this, I have, I, have no, I have no argument with that. But, you know, this was genuinely the best we could get using really good faith effort to implement state-of-the-art, right? Um, so why is computer vision object recognition much worse than human object recognition? There are a lot of reasons for this. Um, you know, people talk about cluttered scenes, people talk about context, people talk about common sense reasoning. There are lots of reasons that are raised for why, you know, computer vision today is, is still far inferior to human object recognition. One reason that I think is not much exploited in the literature is that humans use a fovea um, to obtain high resolution images of objects, and recognizing objects is just much easier from high resolution images. Right? So the fovea is the um, central area of your eye that gives you a very high resolution image of what you look at. 
And so just just give you a concrete example. Um, if I ask you, what is this object? Can you guys tell? Wow, you guys are good. <laughs> um, once I show you high-res images, it's infinitely easier to recognize what this object is. And, and the picture on the left is what a staple looks like at five meters distance from a robot. So no wonder it's so hard to get robots to recognize objects. So um, just, just be clear, right? If, if I'm you know, facing you like this, I actually do not have enough pixels in my eyes to recognize that that's a laptop down there. Right? For me to recognize this laptop in front of me, I need to turn my eyes, look directly at it, get a high resolution image I can now recognize as a laptop and um, look away and continue to track this black blob in my peripheral vision and I know it's still a laptop. So it turns out um, using off-the-shelf hardware you can fairly straightforwardly um, replicate this sort of foveal uh, uh, peripheral vision system in which you can use a panto zoom camera, a camera that can point at different locations and zoom into different scenes, different areas um, to simulate a steerable phobia. And I've done very sort of what, related work using RFID tags. Um, and, and in this setup, you can also use a fixed wide angle camera to simulate your peripheral vision. And you can then learn a foveal control strategy to decide where to look next so as to maximize information gain or minimize entropy or minimize uncertainty about, about what's in the world. Okay? Um, and so let me just show you a video that, that illustrates how this works. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll continue the video in a second. But in the upper left hand corner is what we call the interest belief state, which is a learned estimate of how interesting different parts of the scene are. Formally, it's a learned estimate of the probability that you detect a new object if you look at a certain part of the scene. The upper right hand corner is the low resolution but wide angle peripheral view. And the uh, low le lower left hand corner is the high res foveal view. And so as the algorithm runs using the learned interest belief state shown on the upper left to guide where to point the foveal next, um, you can sort of tell that you know, it's so much easier to recognize objects from the high resolution foveal view on the lower left than it is to recognize it from the vague blurs in the upper right video. Um, more quantitatively, you know, this, this gives you significant performance improvements as well. And um, just to be clear, if any of you have, and, and one, one interesting thing about this problem is that if you're the sort of researcher um, that, you know, sits at your computer downloading images off the internet all day, then, then it's like you're not allowed to work on this, right? Because you can't zoom into uh, pictures you downloaded off the internet. And, and of course, internet images is an important domain, so, so clearly you, know, you should work on that too. But I think once you're working in physical systems, there are, there are things you can do that, that lets you get huge performance boosts. Um, and uh, just be clear, if, if, if any of you are building a vision system for a physical space, um, you know, like a security system, you know, or a, a system in a retirement home to monitor retirees to ensure their safety or whatever, I actually think of slapping a fovea on it, a panto zoom camera, as low-hanging fruit for suddenly allowing you to see the whole world in high res and giving you a significant performance boost. Um, just a couple more quick examples of this embodied perception view. Uh, on, on, suppose, um, on, on the top of those examples, suppose you have an object that you can't recognize because you're viewing it as a strange orientation. Um, on an embodied system, what you can do is, uh, we've, we've already talked about algorithms that can grasp objects, right? even objects you can't recognize, you've never seen before. So what you can do is you can even reach out to grasp or rotate the object or move yourself to see the object from a different perspective, which allows you to recognize it much better. And so in our experiments, that gives you a 69% error reduction. Um, and finally, it's on the bottom, you know, whereas a lot of computer vision has focused on the problem of perception using visible light images, which, which is clearly an important problem, um, once you're using an embodied system, you can also use other sensors. And we're certainly not the only ones to do this. Lots of people are doing this. But I, um, I actually believe we may have been amongst the, f I believe we're actually amongst the first, uh, together with people at CMU, to use um, depth perception for, for object recognition like this. But um, if you use other sensors like laser scan, to give you a um, limited amount of depth information. From that limited amount of deformation, you can um, you know, construct low-level depth features and use that for recognition. Then this gives you, in our experiments, say 83% error reduction. And when you do these things, you know, foveal perception or seeing objects from multiple perspectives or uh, using multiple sensors, if you knock off, you know, 70% of the error here, 80% of the error there, pretty soon you actually get vision systems that work pretty well. And in fact, um, 
um, on our original problem using an um, embodied vision system, um, you know, figure on the right shows shows actually a fairly typical result that we get. And I'll say say more about this later. Okay. So one theme that has been underlying everything I've said, both for the control and the, per and the perception part, um, one theme that's come up was the idea of low-level feature representations. And so I just want to talk a little bit more about that. Right? And in particular, in the perception piece I just talked about, um, the way we recognize, say, the stapler using images and laser, you know, limited depth information from lasers, what have you, was we'd take the image, we would construct low-level vision features, like edge detection is what I'm showing on the screen, that I guess not sure you can see the contrast. Um, and given the limited 3D information, you construct you know, low-level depth features, and it's those features that are given to a machine learning algorithm to try to detect the stapler. And, and in the examples that I used when I was talking about controls, you know, there was also for grasping a coffee mug, there was the low level features fed to the algorithm for learning to grasp an object, and even for controlling helicopters, it was low level features of the state. Um, and, and I guess since we, um, since we gave up on complex world representations, um, these low level features are now the way by which our algorithm sees the world, and, and I think this lends them an extra degree of importance. And in fact, um, this sort of template is very common for many AI and learning algorithms. And so I think one key question is, where do we get these low-level representations from? So in computer vision, the state-of-the-art answer to where you get these low-level feature representations is there are teams of tens or hundreds or thousands of researchers around the world that have spent their lives engineering features for computer vision. And you see just a few examples up here. And, and so I don't want to criticize this work, right? Ideas like SIF, these are actually incredibly clever, incredibly complex hand design features. And it actually works really well when, when, when someone like David Lowe spends 10 years engineering the stuff, it actually works really well. Um, but you have to ask, you know, is this the best way to go about it? And is this the best way to scale? That was vision. Um, how about audio tasks? Um, how do you get representations for audio? The state-of-the-art answer is there are tens or hundreds or thousands of audio researchers around the world that spend their lives, decades of their career, hand engineering representations or features for audio. And again, some of these are very clever ideas, very complex, very clever algorithms. But you have to ask again, you know, is, is, is this the best thing to do, to have these large separate communities engineering representations? And in fact, when you work in robotics, this question is um, especially urgent because for many robots, we often have a wide range of sensors. Um, you know, we saw like visible light, uh, camera rays, audio. Oh, it turns out that if you want to detect people, um, thermal infrared is, is a particularly good sensor because well, we as people, we emit heat, and so we glow in thermal infrared images, um, as well as uh, you know, various types of 3D range scanners. And if every time you buy a new sensor and put a new sensor on your robot, you need to hire 10 or 100 or 1,000 researchers to engineer features for 10 years, you know, that's just not going to scale. And so um, one question I want to pose is, can we automatically learn good sensor representations? So this um, next piece of work takes some inspiration from biology. And uh, like many of you, I suspect, I tend to treat biological inspiration with great caution and even you know, a healthy, at least a healthy dose of skepticism. But, but let me just tell you a little bit about, but let me just tell you about this because, because I think it's really cool. So it turns out there's some evidence, there's, there's, a, there's a hypothesis, I say maybe controversial, but there's a hypothesis that the brain um, has one algorithm or uses one algorithm to learn to represent a wide range of different sensor modalities. So um, let me give you an example. So on the top left is an example of someone seeing with, with, with their tongue, right? So the way this works is um, strap a camera to a person's forehead facing forward. So you take a grayscale image of what's in front of you, and you then run the wire to your tongue, and you place on top of your tongue a 2D grid, a 2D array, 2D array of electrodes, so that each pixel intensity value gets mapped to a different voltage on one point of your tongue, where you know a dark pixel may be a high voltage, and a lighter pixel may be a lower voltage. And it turns out that even as adults today, um, with a small number of hours of training, you and I can still learn to see about tongues. And, 
Um, this system is called BrainPort. It's undergoing FDA trials now. Right? It's a commercial entity. Um, human echolocation. So it turns out that, let's see, um, if you snap your fingers, right, or uh, click your tongue, it's possible for people to train themselves to interpret the pattern of sounds you know, going from their, their fingers or the tongue bouncing off the environment and coming back to your ears. It's possible for people to learn to interpret that as sonar. Um, um, and, and do human echolocation and detect obstacles. And so there are actually amazing videos you know, on, on YouTube you can find of, um, of you know, people who are blind. Actually, actually the most amazing was one kid who has no eyeballs. Eyeballs are removed because of cancer. The person with no eyeballs who can ride a skateboard, who can shoot basketball hoops um, through echolocation. And there are, now, there are actually now schools to try to teach young blind children um, you know, human echolocation. Um, one last fun example. Uh, this was done at MIT. This the first done at MIT. Now replicated on four mammals. Um, let's see. That red region on your brain is called the auditory cortex. It's the part of your brain that normally perceives sound. And um, so it turns out what you can do is, speaking a little loosely, rewire the brain to cut the wire between the ears and your auditory cortex, and rewire the brain so that you know the optic signal from your eyes get fed to the auditory cortex. It turns out if you do this, your auditory cortex learns to see. Okay, maybe putting that in quotes. So based on this, and, and frankly, and, and actually, frankly, many other many other examples, um, there's a hypothesis, maybe controversial, maybe false, but it's a hypothesis that the brain that you know, if, if the same piece of brain tissue can learn sight or sound, or if, if, if your brain has an hour, or in fact, if the same piece of brain tissue can learn sight or sound or touch, and if you can learn to um, perceive using even sensor modalities that we did not evolve with, like electrodes on your tongue. Um, maybe, maybe we can develop a learning algorithm to do this too. So here's a problem I'd like to pose. Um, given a large collection of images, is it possible to learn a better way to represent images than the raw pixel intensity values? Can you learn a representation from this? And in fact, going beyond images, um, Given a large collection of audio clips, can you learn a better way to represent sound than the raw audio? And um, I think we also, on, and, or given a large collection of 3D range scans, can you find a better rep representation for deaf images? And I think some of these representations, especially well, 3D range scans, does not correspond to any natural human sense. And, and I think it kind of makes sense to do this because our human intuitions for how to hand engineer features for them are, are maybe especially weak. So um, to formalize this in, as, as a machine learning problem, uh, this, is, this is maybe one formalization of this problem, which is, um, let's see, here's my cartoon illustration of a traditional machine learning problem called supervised learning, right? in which if I want to uh, distinguish between cars and motorcycles, I show you a lot of labeled examples of cars, I show you a lot of labeled examples of motorcycles. After your algorithm trains, I ask, what is that? Right? So standard supervised machine learning. A few years ago, we proposed a different machine learning formalism, which, which we call self-taught learning, um, that tries to use unlabeled data. And this is one of many possible ways to use unlabeled data. This is maybe just our take on it. In which the problem is, um, given a large collection of unlabeled natural images, can you do whatever you want and um, maybe learn a representation of images so that given just a tiny number of labeled examples of cars, a tiny number of labeled examples of motorcycles, can you, can you figure out you know, what, what, the, what the image in your test set is? And, and I think the challenge is to use images of you know, sunsets, horses, buildings, or whatever to f help you figure out that the image on the lower right is, is a car. So it turns out that there is an algorithm that can sort of do this. They can look at the natural images to learn a better way of representing uh, scenes than the raw pixel intensities. And that algorithm is called sparse coding. It's due to um, Osthausen and Thiel. It's actually, what, it's like over, it's, it's, it's over a decade old. And um, let me just explain what the algorithm does. So this is a learning algorithm that takes as input a collection of images, x1 through xm, which are, say, n by n images, um, so re represented as rn by n. And what sparse coding does is it learns a dictionary of basis functions so that each input image x ten, can be decomposed as a linear combination of a small number of these uh, dictionary of basis functions. 
Okay, this is subject to the to the constraint that the AJs are mostly zero, if only that the AJs are sparse. Okay, so you're going to learn a large dictionary of basis functions, maybe 50 of them, um, or 500, right? And then try to decompose each image as a linear combination of just a tiny subset of these basis functions. And so this is um, an example of, of you know, what, what, what the trained algorithm looks like, in which um, on the top is an example of, you know, a learned dictionary of basis functions, uh, uh, learned 50 in this case, and showing a small subset of them. And then given a new image, it learns, it, it represents this image, x, as a linear combination of a tiny subset of this much larger dictionary of basis functions. Okay, and, and here are just a couple more examples. And if you look at the example on the top, for instance, what this means is that um, instead of representing this image patch as a 196 real numbers, this is a 14 by 14 pixel image, so there's 196 real numbers. Instead of representing this um, uh, image using a vector of 196 real numbers, you can instead represent it using this much more compact representation. You're saying that you have 0.6 times the first image plus 0.8 times the second image plus 0.4 times the third image. Speaking a little bit loosely, this algorithm has, quote, invented edge detection, right? Speaking loosely, this algorithm has um, learned feature representations that look like edges, and it automatically learns to represent images in terms of the edges that appear in it, rather than in terms of the raw pixel intensity values. And so this gives you a more succinct or higher level or more abstract representation of an image than the raw pixel intensity values. So that was, uh, what, 1996, I guess, and, and machine learning actually stayed there for about 10 years. Because, uh, so, you know, sparse coding is an algorithm that can go from pixels and put together pixels to, to, to find edges. But in computer vision, we already know how to do edge detection, right? You know, we already know, you know algorithms like standard computer vision edge detection algorithms, we already know how to find edges. So, so who cares if you can, quote, reinvent edge detection using machine learning? So, Machine learning, machine learning stayed there for about 10 years. Only a few years ago that a um, uh, number of people, uh, actually to a large part building on Jeff Hinton's work, figured out that you can actually repeat this process and go to even more complex and high level representations. So just as you can put together pixels to form um, edges, you can put together edges to form models of object parts and put together um, object parts to form more complete models of objects. And um, this is done, there's actually a community of us, community of people, not just myself, working on this, um, really most notably Jeff Hinton, I should say again. But it turns out by taking these sorts of algorithms and, and repeating this algorithm, um, recently you know, discovered that you can learn much more complex representations going up this, this feature hierarchy. And so um, you can then take these low-level representations and apply them to different tasks. Um, this is one example of, um, I guess this is my student, Hong Lak Lee, working with Daphne Collar, a friend and colleague, um, on, uh, multi, on, on sort of standard uh, computer vision tasks of multi-class segmentation and using these sorts of feature learning results, you know, gave, consistently gave improvements. Um, I said in computer vision, the learned features are you know, competitive with and sometimes superior, but also sometimes inferior to the best hand engineering representations. But uh, let me show you a different result of applying really the same learning algorithm to audio. So it turns out in the audio world, phoneme classification is one of the problems that people compete on. And so, you know, the, the, the standard timid, uh, timid data set phoneme classification benchmarks, and this is a sort of problem where if you get a 0.1% improvement on, on the benchmark, you write a paper on it, right? So in the last decade, there was about, um, I think, 1.5%. I, I may have the number slightly wrong, but there was about 1.5% improvement um, on, on, on this benchmark in the last decade by, you know, oh, one of the labels is missing, not sure but by, by various authors in the field. And um, Hong Lak applying this sort of unsupervised feature learning algorithm recently published a number that was strictly better than the you know, best previously published results and by a large margin. I think it was about 0.7% improvement over the best. So about roughly comparable to half a decade's worth of improvement. Um, and the cool thing about this is that this was work done by, um, it turns out that the cool thing about this is that both the uh, computer vision and the audio results was done by one grad student, Hong Lak, Hong Lak Lee, 
who is neither an expert in computer vision nor an expert in audio, but only an expert in machine learning, and by using the same algorithm, on two, on, by using really exactly the same probabilistic model applied to two very different input modalities, he was able to learn feature representations that compete, you know, sometimes more, sometimes less successfully, but I think are competitive with the best hand engineered approaches by two different and large communities of, of people hand engineering things. Right? So, so and the fact is, of so one grad student, you know, was something I'm particularly proud of. Um, before I close out this, this section on unsupervised feature learning, just mention weaknesses and criticisms. Um, when I talk about this work, you know, one, one, one question that often comes up is, should, is, do we really want to learn these low-level feature representations? Or uh, are we better off encoding prior knowledge about the structure of images, for instance? Um, I don't have a great answer to that. I think this is a valid criticism. I tend to answer this criticism by, by referring to the, I think, the debate in um, NLP, natural language processing, about 20 years ago, between the linguists and uh, you know dumb machine learning guys like me, right? And, and I think 20 years ago there was a serious debate in NLP about whether it's better to code up complex linguistic theories, or whether it's better to try to learn everything. And I think in NLP, um, I think it's fairly clear which argument carried the day. Today's systems use really none of the extremely complex hand coding, complex linguistic theories that, that you know, linguists were envisioning using like 20, 30 years ago. Um, but I guess the question of which argument will carry the day still remains to be seen in, 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 in computer vision and audio. Um, Results now you compare with the best engineered systems, and, and this is indeed true for some domains. Um, but it turns out that, so I, I guess I was presenting work done at Stanford mostly, but uh, um, in um, computer vision competitions, Pascal VLC, you know, Kai Yu at NEC learned features and beat everyone else in computer vision by a large margin. And so I think these ideas of uh, 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 learning features are, are actually increasingly competitive with more domains, although it's clear that, that you know, our community still has work to be done. So, um, just to wrap up, and, and I think um, using these sorts of uh, uh, feature learning algorithms is, is particularly useful for many robotics tasks um, which do not correspond to the natural human senses uh, uh, and for which our human intuition about how to hand engineer features for them may be especially weak. Okay. So, um, Putting together some of the things I talked about, on um, I started off this talk motivating it with the goal of general purpose robotics and talked about some of the low level control and low level perception problems and talked about embodiments and talked about you know using low level features rather than explicit world models to solve a range of problems. So how do we put these pieces back together to build these sort of general purpose agents? Um, we've made it and made a fair, we've made, I think, a large amount of progress on fetching things and taking inventory. We're going to talk about those. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll nail cleaning and tidying up soon, and, and, and the others remain very challenging still. But let me start by talking about the problem of fetching objects. And to put this in a bit of historical context, it turns out that, so, so in other words, we'd like to get a robot to uh, um, you know, fetch something from, for me from a different office. Like, tell the robot, stare, please fetch the stapler from my office and have it do that. But put this in his historical context, it turns out that um, in AI, in 94, there was also um, a, 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 an attempt on, on the flaky robot to do something like this. So um, let me actually go and show you this 1994 video. Flaky, get the budget from Karen. Karen, please give me budget file. Flaky, here's the file. Uh, okay, thanks. All right, so. I think this is actually an amazing result for his day, but, but what you saw was basically a robot that could do speech, that could navigate, and could do high-level planning. It turned out that she could do fairly complicated high-level planning. But what this older work in AI didn't address was, was, was the low-level perception 
and control problems. It couldn't pick up the budget file. It actually had no idea if the budget file was already placed on its back or not. Um, and it also could not manipulate the environment. And that's why, for instance, all the doors had to be left open in advance for the robot. Okay? So here's a um, fashion object, you know, done, done I guess, what, uh, uh, on, on, on our latest project. Um, and let's see, here's the problem we face, right? In order to um, have the robot execute a, you know, stair, please fetch the stapler from my office task, um, we've developed a number of different components for object recognition, to recognize the stapler, robotic grasping, which also talks about, um, as well as a number of other components, the controller, uh, opening doors, navigation, and spoken dialogue. And we have to put all these components together onto one robot to make it carry out the task. So how do we integrate these things onto one robot? Um, if you refer to Russell and Norvig again, you know, then, then this was the structure of intelligent agents picture that uh, shown on the lower left that I had earlier. But it turns out that, as we've already seen, right, we really don't know how to construct a representation of what the world is like. And even if you have some complicated representation in like first order logic or what have you, um, you know, it, it's just sort of monolithic planning architecture, right, to decide what action to take is, is very difficult to, to, to implement especially when you're doing things like low-level controls and perception. And so Routen is using this sort of architecture. Um, this is instead something closer to, to, to a picture of what we have, right? Where we have all of these different modules, handling spoken dialogue, localization, navigation, object recognition, and so on. And we need to put all of them together between the sensors and the actuators in order to um, have the robot carry out the task. This next piece, um, called ROS, or the robot OS, was motivated to a large part by the design of the Unix operating system. So one of the philosophies of Unix that I think has made it very powerful is that it gives you tons of small programs that can be combined quickly to carry out a huge range of tasks. So you know that command up there, cat data.txt, pipe to cut, pipe to sort, pipe to unique. This allows you to very quickly define a pipeline to do something really complicated by putting together a number of relatively simple programs. So as part of the, um, uh, uh, the STAIR project at Stanford, we started a robot, started a open source software effort called ROS. Um, and uh, I should say, it's, uh, I guess there's a local company called Willow Garage that has taken ROS and frankly done a ton more work on it than, than, than we have and built some very impressive open source piece of software. Um, and what ROS allows you to do is take all of these different components and very rapidly hook them up to each other um, so as to have all of these different pieces act in concert to carry out the, the, the fetch, and, fetch and object um, task. And let me go ahead and show you a video of what that looks like. Yeah, please fetch a stapler from Fox office. I will fetch a stapler for you. So that was the spoken dialogue system uh, kicking off the application. Robot uses standard indoor mobile robot navigation to navigate to the appropriate office. Um, now it uses computer vision to detect the door handle. On the lower left, the crosshairs shows where it thinks it's found the door. One of the, the other claims to fame um, of this robot is that we were the first to build a robot that can open previously unseen, they can autonomously open novel doors, or open previously unseen doors. Oh, there's a panto zoom camera, uh, look scanning past the scenes to try to find the stapler. The camera view is shown on the lower right, and you can still see the camera moving. Zooms in, that shows where it thinks it's found the stapler. Um, and not sure if you can see the cross, the little red cross shows the learned grass point. Um, right for, for the best location at which to pick up a stapler. Uses um, motion planning and so on to uh, plan a path for the robot arm to grasp the stapler. And finally, switches back to um, indoor mobile robot navigation uh, to navigate back to deliver the stapler. How is your stapler? And she didn't even say thank you. <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> um, and I should say that while this was obviously a quote demo, you know, on the other hand, we've tried this out in, 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 in a bunch of settings, and this actually kind of works. And so even though this was a demo, I think of this as perhaps the genuine beginnings of robots able to usefully fetch items from around the office, even, even fairly unconstrained spaces like our offices.
So one of the nice things about having put together so many components is that you can then rapidly rewire them to build other applications as well. So let me say a little bit about the, the second application we worked on, on taking inventory. So here's a map of the uh, Gates Computer Science Building. Um, I believe we built this map using Ron software, um, which works amazing, by the way. Um, and so let's see, there are four offices in a row. And zooming in, you know, uh, what we want to do was um, ha imagine, it, let's say everyone's gone home at night. What we want to do was, maybe after everyone's gone home, send a robot into these offices to, quote, take inventory. Like, say, find out where all the coffee mugs are. You can pick some of the options if you want. We, we did coffee mugs. And so having built most of these components already, um, what you can do is you know, take the components you need and use ROS to quickly wire these components up for, we already have components for navigation, for opening doors, um, for you know, limited, uh, for, for object recognition and so on. You can fairly rapidly wire up the appropriate components to build the inventory taking application. And when you do that, um, let me show you what this looks like. So this is actually the same door opening code as before, in which the robot you know, uses vision to perceive a novel door handle, um, goes in. And, and one new piece was here is actually using a laser scanner to give, it, to give itself a limited amount of depth information. So as, as, as the laser falls on the different depths, it gives a you know, limited uh, a distance or limited depth measurements for um, <clears throat> for the options and scene. So it finishes scanning the first office, and then we're going to do the second office, and so on. Okay? And these are the results. So if you were to use only visible light images, so if you were to use only quote, standard computer vision methods done on images, this was the result we got, where every red dot and every black dot is a mistake made by our computer vision algorithm. Right? In contrast, um, by taking advantage of the fact that you can use depth information and taking advantage of the fact that you can look at objects from multiple perspectives, by using this sort of embodied perception, this was the result we got. So let's see, I think there were um, seven coffee mugs left in their natural places by the denizens of these four, of, of, by the denizens of these four offices. We added an additional 21 coffee mugs, making it a total of 28. And the robot actually got 28 for 28. Um, and there, in fact, are the um, automatically extracted images of the coffee mug. Sorry, contrast. Hard to see if this contrast. Um, and, and we've repeated this, this experiment a few times, and zero to two mistakes is, is, actually, is a fairly typical result. And, um, and, and once again, you know, while this was another quote demo, um, we've done this many times, and this actually works very reliably, very robustly. And, and so um, I think this is also maybe the genuine beginnings of robots able to usefully fetch items, um, take inventory, and so on. So, um, so far we've fielded the fetch an object and inventory taking application. Uh, we've also done the third application to check if someone's in their office. We hope to do the tidying up the desk application soon. Um, and a few, few others in, in, in the pipeline, you know, like checking if doors are locked, dropping off items off, and so on. Um, and I guess, have this hypothesis that as we build up basic components like, like you see up there, the number of applications you can build by rapidly hooking up these components grows rapidly you know, as a function, it grows really combinatorially maybe as a function of the number of quote basic components you have. And so um, really motivated in part by that, you know, we together with Willow Garage have tried to build up this um, open source community around, around ROS where you can really go online and download software to, 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 uh, with, with many of these components and when, where, where others will hopefully contribute their own components back to um, so that we as a community can, can rapidly scale up and just build you know, many more rich and interesting applications. Um, to wrap up, so let's say a little bit about future challenges and also a um, little bit about where I think our work may have, may, may have uh, come up a little short, some of the weaknesses of this work and where I think we may have come up a little bit short. So when we started the project, STAIR project about, what, four years ago? 
Um, one of the main motivations was that the field of AI has fragmented into many different subfields, and each of the boxes up there is an entirely separate, is, is an almost entirely separate research area with almost entirely separate conferences and so on. And we wanted to find unifying challenge problems that will reintegrate these disparate subfields of AI. And to a very limited extent, we've maybe done that by taking, you know, developing many of these components and, and getting them to work in concert on one robot platform. But um, where we've really fallen short so far, I think, is, is, is maybe part of the original vision of uh, making this one algorithm. Right? And uh, in fact, what we have right now is a number of algorithms that happen to run on the same platform. But um, I think there's a deeper level of integration that one could strive for to make these different components act in concert in, in a sort of a deeper, you know, integrated representation way. And um, you know, perhaps a naive way to do this would require all the n squared effort to make you know n algorithms into one algorithm. And, and to a limited extent, I think we've done that, right? So you know, our work on grasping, picking up novel objects, I think that really integrates um, computer vision and manipulation in a in a fairly deep way that, that, that has been done before. Um, the work on perception really integrates computer vision and embodiment, and I think, at a fairly deep level, and so on. But um, I think, you know, if we're doing this one pair of albums at a time, then there's sort of a lot more, there's a long ways to go. And so one thing that um, we've been exploring is um, trying to have a world database model to have these different algorithms write into, so that it may take only order n effort to link up n, prob n algorithms. And I know that whereas a lot of what I was saying earlier was about you know, not using explicit world models, and that certainly exacerbates the problem of how you have these unified representations. Um, and, and I don't think any of us know what the right answer is. It's probably not right, the right answer to build full 3D models of the world, or to uh, probably not the right answer to describe the world in gory detail using first order logic. Um, but I think an important research direction is to figure out how to combine the representations that we do use today with the more traditional ones used in AI um, and to find an, find, an, uh, inter find an appropriate intermediate level of representation. Um, so I guess there are lots of people doing very insightful work at the high levels of representation using first order logic and what have you. And if nothing else, by doing the low level control and perception work, I hope that you know, that would, and, and make it open source in ROS. I hope that, uh, if nothing else, they'll provide a platform that can be used to um, explore the higher levels of representation in the context of a grounded robotics problem. So, um, to wrap up, <clears throat> talks about the problem of general purpose robotics um, and talks about um, needing to solve low-level perception and control problems in order to, to try to develop these sorts of robots. And um, our discussion on perception and control led us into this idea of embodied perception, which I think is very different than, than the problem of downloading images off the internet, um, though that's important too. And so well as this idea of uh, using low-level sensor representations right, as the representation um, that using low-level sensor representations to learn to perform different perception and control tasks rather than trying to build very complex, explicit world models. And motivated by that, that led into a discussion on um, unsupervised feature learning of how to try to learn even these low-level sensor representations rather than you know, trying to hand-engineer them. And finally, um, you saw how many of these ideas could be integrated um, to, to build a range of applications like fetching a stapler, inventory taking, and so on. And um, just to acknowledge the, the, I guess, mainly current and former PhD students, uh, Peter, Adam, Steve, Ellen, Zico, Kwok, Hanglak, Morgan, Ogre, and Ashutosh that had done uh, most of this work, and um, also a number of other collaborators. Thanks very much.